Um, the next talk will be by Sarah Wimson. Uh, Hi, can everyone hear me? Oh, oh yes. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. It'll be Sarah Wimson, uh, Differential Scaling of Spider Groups. Okay, thank you, Sarah. All right. Um, yeah, so my name is Sarah Wilmson. Um, I'm from the University of North Texas, and today I'm talking about differential scaling in spiders. So um, spiders are super diverse. They have very diverse life history traits and foraging strategies, and there's a lot of them. So I have a couple pictured here. Um, and this has implications for metabolic rates. So different lifestyle traits um, kind of depict whether their metabolic rate is going to be high or low. And it, Sarah, I believe you're muted. I don't know. Oh, Sorry, okay. I don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, so ranges in body size also have implications for metabolic rate because of surface area to volume ratios. So um, diffusion um, is limited by body mass, kind of. Um, the metabolic theory of ecology is this regression of two measures. And usually it is standard metabolic rate, which is um, a resting metabolic rate at a specific temperature for an ectotherm. Um, and that is by body mass. So this is a exponential curve that when you log it becomes a straight line. And this graph is looking at a bunch of different organisms, including plants. Um, and when you, uh, when you regress these two um, measurements, you get a overall slope of about 0.75. And this has been in the literature for a long time of uh, hypotheses about why this may happen and explanations for why it's always 0.75. Um, many of these theories ignore differences between organisms, um, like ecological differences and lifestyle traits. Um, however, Glazier's metabolic levels boundary hypothesis tries to take into account the differences between organisms. Um, and so what it is saying is that the slope varies inversely with maintenance costs. So when we have an organism that has a higher metabolic rate or a high maintenance animal with um, uh, higher metabolic rates, we should see scaling at about 0.66 or two thirds. Um, and that's because it's limited by the surface area to volume ratio and nutrient cycling. So it's limited by how fast things can diffuse in and out and uh, the size of the animal. On the other end, we have low maintenance animals, um, which will scale more towards one. And that's because they are not limited by surface area to volume ratio. They're limited in, instead by their power output and a energy production. So their mitochondrial um, rate, uh, metabolic rate. Um, and so this is predictive of ecological and lifestyle traits. Killen et al. in 2010, looked at a bunch of fish, fish species and looked at foraging strategy and how it affects slope. So this graph has the scaling exponent, which is B here, and the resting metabolic level. Um, and in highly active fish or pelagic fish like tuna, they scale um, down here, sorry, this is the scaling exponent at 0.66 or 67, and they have a high resting metabolic rate. And then the reverse is true for benthic, or more sedentary fish, a slope around one um, and a lower met resting metabolic rate. So this um, MLB hypothesis, the metabolic levels boundary hypothesis, hypothesis has been supported in many different organisms and including spiders. So Ennis et al. looked at this in a bunch of invertebrate taxa um, and found that there's a potential for scaling actually below that 0.66. Um, and this is probably due to their um, oxygen delivery system and nutrient system. So these are a bunch of different attacks of, of invertebrates. Um, and invertebrate nutrient systems are very varied, right? You have diffusion in some, um, trachea in a lot of um, insects and things like that, and also spiders. Um, and they mostly have open cardiovascular systems. So they're more, um, they're very different from vertebrate systems. Um, spiders specifically have book lungs um, and they have differential trachea um, depending on the species. Um, their trachea actually evolved from book lungs. So um, the, they're derived from book lungs um, multiple times. 
Um, Ramirez et al. 2021 actually just showed this, um, and it they evolved in conjunction with silk and aerial web building in Iranians. Um, in more derived spiders like Saltisids, there's actually trachea that serve specific muscle groups. Um, and these, the advent of trachea is actually coincided with a reduction in cardiovascular branching. So in summary, lifestyle affects scaling in many different organisms, including spiders, and respiratory system potentially limits scaling below 0.66 in some spiders. Um, so my question is, how do different respiratory systems and lifestyles relate to scaling? Um, and my hypothesis is that differences in lifestyle and respiratory structures together will affect the scaling in different groups of spiders. So my data set is a conglomerate of a lot of different papers. Um, I collected papers on spider metabolic rate. Um, and at the end of the day, I had 38 papers with 18 families and 59 species represented. I looked at just standard metabolic rate and my body mass was, had a range of over five orders of magnitude. Um, so I took a phylogeny and I looked at, and I grouped my species together in monophyletic groups based on lifestyle traits and um, respiratory morphology. So the first one is my yellow morphs. These are tarantulas or um, larger body spiders, less derived spiders, more, um, more ancestral. They have two pairs of book lungs, as you might know. Weavers, um, which are these or uh, generally web building spiders, um, they are the ones that have evolved trachea in conjunction with their web building. And so they have um, various trachea and also a, one pair of book lungs in most of them. And then the RTA clade, which is retro, retrolateral tibial apophysis clade. Um, these guys are more ground running. They have varied um, tracheal as well as book lungs. And they, again, have these trachea that um, feed specific muscle groups. The last two are the lost trachea clade, which actually secondarily um, lost their trachea, so they only have one pair of book lungs. Um, I had to exclude this group because uh, I didn't have enough uh, values. Um, and then the last one is the wanderers, and these are the uh, recluses and things like that. There isn't a lot known about their tracheal morphology. Um, so I took, the, uh, I did regressions of all of this data. I looked at multiple linear regressions. And this is the data, just oxygen concentration, or I'm sorry, oxygen consumption over here and mass, and these are log scale. So you can see the color, uh, color coded, um, data points, and you can see some of them are starting to group together. You can see that even when we don't correct for temperature or um, group. So I had two different predictive models, a linear model, uh, which is the standard metabolic rate, and this is all logged, so it's a straight line. Um, and then I have my scaling exponent here and my intercept here, and I corrected, this is a correction for temperature. So I only use data points that I had temperature um, data for. Um, and then my phylogenetic model, model, which accounted for my groups, um, is the same model, except it has this subscript for, um, for the different groups. Um, and so these are my two models. These are just the ASC scores I wanted to show you. Um, I had uh, a, a, the ASC score for a phylogenetic was a lot lower. Um, so this was the model that I went with. And here are the slopes. Um, this is the slopes on a graph so you can see them better. The gray boxes represent um, 0.66 to 1, and then this line in the center is 0.75. So what we saw was the RTA clade actually scales uh, pretty low at 0.6. The weavers, on the other hand, have a pretty high scaling rate um, at like 0.9. My gallomorphs um, are right in the middle. And then for the wanderers, this was the group that I had the least amount of data for. So um, it was significant, but the um, standard error is just very large. Um, so it's hard to make predictions about why this might be this way without more data. So um, the RTA clade we saw scales pretty low, below the 0.66. 6. 
Um, so we would say that this is limited by stand, uh, sorry, surface area to volume ratio. Um, and that makes sense because these guys are active foragers. Here's a video of um, a rabidosa. Um, and they not only actively forage for prey, but they actively um, grab their prey um, and they don't let go. Um, so, and they also have these muscle specific trachea that could um, help bring that um, slope down. More minutes. The weavers have a really high slope, right? So they're um, very close to one. And this is probably because they're limited by their output. So um, conversely with the RTA clade, they're very sit and wait predators. They sit in their webs and wait for prey to come to them. Um, and they, they did evolve trachea for web building. So those spinneret organs are probably the highest um, energy consuming organism, organ that they have potentially, but they're specifically fed by trachea. So um, this could allow them to have a, a much higher scaling rate. The mygalomorphs are kind of weird. They're in the middle. They're less active, right? There is some activity with the males. And I didn't split them up by sex, um, but they also have a different oxygen delivery system, right? They're more reliant on their book lungs and their open cardiovascular system. So this could be why they're kind of scaling in the middle between the 0.66 and um, one. For the wanderers, I really, I don't want to really say anything about them because the standard error is so large, it just really needs more data. So there just needs to be more um, data out there. So in conclusion, um, the model, the best model takes into account both group and temperature. Um, all of the groups had significantly different slopes, and this was a proxy for similar lifestyles and tracheal morphology. Um, and respiratory morphology and lifestyle are both important for understanding scaling, scaling in these organisms. Um, so I want to acknowledge my lab, Dr. Ed Jalowski at the University of North Texas, and the Society for allowing me to come present my talk. Um, and I want to do a little plug for myself. Um, I am a PhD candidate this year. I'm hoping to be done in um, next spring. So if you know of anybody who's looking for a postdoc for fall 2020 or even summer 2022, um, uh, let me know. Uh, here's my email address. I'm interested in all of these things. This specifically respiratory morphology and phylogenetics, linking all of the, that together, getting more data on um, tracheal morphology and how that affects physiology. And the ecophysiology of arachnids is also very interesting to me. So coupling physiology with ecology, looking at the consequences of climate change, all of that. Um, and I'm also pretty interested in the effects of pesticides on spider populations. So um, I'll go ahead and leave this up. And yeah, um, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really interesting. Um, first question. Uh, let's see. Did you see any differences in decimal tracheate spiders like aragonine uh, limithi limithids with highly branched tracheae? Um, I, I'm trying to think about my data set. I don't think I had any aragonine um, species, and I think I probably only had one, if any, linifids. Um, mostly my data set was clumped, grouped together. I did separate them by family and looked at that a little bit, um, but they were clumped together to allow for higher um, end values just because um, I had to rely on everybody else doing the, the research and then I took the metabolic rate data. So um, if it wasn't in the literature, I didn't have a metabolic rate data for it. So I might not have had um, those spiders specifically. Great. Another question is, uh, due to the sexual dimorphism in several spiders, do you think sex may have an effect? Um, I, would ex I would expect it to. Um, again, I didn't, the, the data set that I had, I wish I could have um, split it up by sex. Some of that, some of the papers didn't have that information. 
Um, but if, if I were to do the study myself, I would definitely look at differences in, in sex because yeah, you're right. There's a lot of differences um, in not only body size, but also in um, lifestyle, right? Like, especially with my gallimorphs, the males are, you know, moving around and the females are just sitting like uh, all year. So um, there's a lot of differences. I apologize to Cara, I, I missed your question at the very beginning. Um, how did you deal with O2 versus CO2 data in the literature? Um, there is a um, ratio, uh, a oxygen um, CO2 ratio. So if it was in oxygen, which it usually isn't, um, or if it wasn't CO2, um, I can, um, I used an equation to change that over to um, O2. Um, and that's pretty consistent. Um, it takes into account the mitochondria and how much oxygen they're using for every CO2 they're outputting and that kind of thing. Um, I see this okay. one that says any okay. data um, collected. That a, oh. I'll, I'll have to cut you off there to uh, Sorry. keep us on time. Yeah, but, if you have any um, questions, feel free to email me. Yes, um, email Sarah. You can also directly message her in the chat. So thank you, Sarah. That was really interesting.